Hello, and welcome to day 44 of Dungeon 23. Today, we're going to be making an addition onto the room we made yesterday, on account of the fact that it would connect these two rooms together. And I do have something kind of special planned, although I suppose every episode is me having something special planned. I suppose this is special because not only is it involving something that we kind of did a little bit of in the last floor, which was the idea of like a little bit of like faction play, and including some more world building touches tying into the whole hook horror thing. This one's going to include something new, that being a moral dilemma, or rather an ethical dilemma. Do not conflate the two, they are not the same thing. Semantics aside, Let's quickly sketch out the room, and then I'll explain what I kind of want to do. Now, the room's going to be fairly basic. Uh, let's make this a two door wide. And in the corner right here, we're going to have a chest. But it's not just going to be a regular chest. Oh, where is my chest? Here it is. It's actually going to be a mimic, but not just any mimic, a wounded, oh, wounded mimic, a mimic that is injured. Not only to make it more of easier for the party to fight if they choose to, but also to have a bit of a moral dilemma in that here's a mimic that is injured. It can't really put up a good fight. Do we try to help it? Now you may be thinking, no, you shouldn't help it because you have no incentive to. It's just an animal basically. And we shouldn't give assistance to animals when they're dying because you know, why would we? It's not like they're people or anything like that. And that is stupid, honestly. If you think that like, Outside of like a character, if you like genuinely believe that like a sick or dying animal deserves no assistance whatsoever, that's kind of messed up. Like I understand saying like, okay, there's this creature and it's not worth it to get involved. It's risky to get involved or it's just an unfair part of life. You'd like to do something about it, but really there's only so much you could do. And we'll think of like this, like a deer gets hit by a car and is like limping around. Now, you, you want to help it, but you can't really do anything about it. And uh, I think if you don't have like that kind of like baseline empathy for just the world around you, I think there may be something wrong with you. But that's besides the point. What's important is I have a character sheet for this mimic and I may have gone a little bit overboard. But I did include lots of tidbits for skill checks to basically have this be a fully fleshed out encounter. So let me just hop over to the Google document, which I have it in, and uh, we'll check it out. Now, what we have here is our wounded mimic character sheet. Now, in case you just kind of forgot or it didn't be as clear as I wanted to be, a lot of the monsters I put down, I just don't use or don't make character sheets for because it's going to be something like goblins which it just use a random goblin character sheet, doesn't matter like the bush goblins fun but it doesn't do anything that necessitates his own character sheet and if you do use a lot of rules compendiums that are maybe a bit you know on the down low you know maybe kind of bootleggy uh you'll notice that like or just i don't just any compendium you see a lot of like npcs from adventurer modules that are just, ju it's just the monster. Like, here's a goblin NPC. It's just the same exact stack block as just a regular goblin. Or here's the orc bartender and his stat sheet is just an orc sheet, you know? So I don't bother with uh, character sheets for those kinds of, you know, NPCs, monsters, whatever. But something like this, where there is a mechanical reason to do so, or they're like an important creature, you know, I'm going to do it. So going through, it is a medium monstrosity because that is what most mimics are. They're always monstrosities, even though technically they should be constructs because they're constructed, they're made by wizards. 
like in the lore they were made by wizards for like a purpose and then they kind of got out of their like containment or whatever mage made them the wizard tower they kind of got out and spread across the world and that's why like they're considered like creatures out in the world when in reality they're just like basically like lab experiments and you know artificial creatures are constructs even ones that are biological are constructs like uh flesh golems are constructs humunculi are constructs even though they're like biological you know they're not machines but they're still artificially created same thing goes for like the ochre jellies i believe that they're actually like made by sorcerers or like a failed polymorph i know like the gibbering mouther is an aberration which is typically reserved for like aliens like alien-like creatures although they were explicitly said to be created by sorcerers so it's all very confusing and every time i talk about a mimic it always devolves into this tangent about how they should technically be constructs but we're just gonna ignore that for now because if we want to get into semantics every creature should be a beast celestial fiend aberration or construct or plant or depending on your perspective everything should be a construct because everything was made by like a god in the lore so it, it or like why is a giant not a humanoid how big does a humanoid have to be to be considered a giant why are some giants large and why are some humanoids large it's just creature types are gonna drive you crazy if you look any deeper than just the surface level and they're unaligned i'm not gonna go into a tangent about alignment because frankly alignment isn't actually that confusing or stupid as people make it out to be now it is an armor class of 12 which is the basic armor class for mimics it's 12 i was gonna give it a lower armor class to reflect that it's hurt but i figured nah it's it's good as it is it only has 20 hp out of the 60 normally they have like 58 or so hp but i just give it 60 so it's flat but it only has 20 of that and it's just gonna sit there injured until someone helps it and has a speed of 10 feet as opposed to 15 feet because you know it's injured it's hurt it's not gonna be able to move as fast it's strength i made it a little bit weaker just by one so it's 15 instead of 17 so it's plus two instead of plus three i may have lowered its constitution to reflect that it's injured i'm not sure at the top of my head but it does have a plus one for con and it doesn't have any save it doesn't have any damage resistances it does have immunity to acid because that's all mimics have immunity to acid no damage vulnerabilities i was contemplating just giving it vulnerability to damage or just regular damage to be you know the signify that's injured but then i have to put a whole bunch of different damage types and that'd be a bit too confusing so i just gave it less health and condition immunity is prone very similar to oozes mimics are always prone they're always sitting on the ground really mimic should also be it was just because they're amorphous it's an the whole thing is going to be something that i'm probably going to bring up multiple times as i do anytime creature type comes up even when it doesn't i'll find a way to talk about it uh stealth plus five for its skills that's just normal mimic stuff its senses are the same as normal mimics and i gave it languages mimic because in the lore of forgotten realms most mimics are intelligent and can talk it's just that the minority of the ones that you find are vicious, unintelligent, and can't speak, and don't have their own language. But the reason you encounter them more is because, as adventurers, it's kind of like confirmation bias. You're going to encounter the more malignant parts of a thing if you go looking for them. It's like being a cop and thinking everyone's a criminal well of course you do because that's who you interact with most of the time but other than the lore reason of that most mimics do technically have a language as i said with the hook horror i just really like the idea of like monsters having their own language and if there's like a wizard in the party who's like yeah i want to take mimic as a language because i think it'll be funny it actually comes up like that's like a major way to have your character shine and frankly, I'm disappointed in 5th edition for not giving more monsters languages because it's just kind of upsetting that like we have this, not only do we have like a limited list of the exotic languages in the player's handbook because so many weird specific languages just aren't listed outside of the character sheet of the monster. And it's just like, it's never used in any meaningful way. 
Like, language is just severely neglected. Like, everyone, just assume everyone speaks common. In fact, most, like, races don't get their own language. Like, I understand, like, Aquans, or rather, like, Water Genasi and Tritons speaking Aquan. That makes sense. What I don't like is how, like, Minotaurs don't have their own language. Tabaxi don't have their own language. I mean, Gricks and giant eagles and giant elks have their own language. But the Tabaxi and Minotaurs don't have their own language. Grung have their own language. I don't think the Grung player race gets its own language, but, you know, that's that's how it is. And that, that really upsets me. So, yeah. Always give your monsters their own language, because it's just, it's just fun. It also encourages your players to learn languages, which is really neglected, because language never matters, for the most part. It's like ammunition, or carrying capacity. It gets hand-waved away with magic items really quickly. Now, it does have Shape Changer, which is basically the same as its normal Mimic counterpart. It just basically polymorphs into an object, and then it could change back to like its grayish amorphous form. And it is a bit weird how it like specifies polymorph because that would suggest it's a magical effect, which could be like subjected to anti magic, which is weird. Like I mean, polymorph means to change shape. It's like like octopus in real life polymorph technically, but it just has like a weird like magical connotation when it really shouldn't be. It has Grappler, which is basically the same as the regular Mimic one. It has advantage on attack rolls against the creature that's grappled by it. You think would just be like normal grappling? Like if you're like restraining some guy, well not restraining, but you, you're in a fight with some guy and you grab one of his hands, and you're like you're holding him close to you, and he can't like physically move away from you, you're basically getting advantage. You're gonna be able to hit him more often. You already have him in your hands. You're already making contact with him. It shouldn't be hard to make contact even more. But that's besides the point. The point is that it's better at attacking things that are grappled by it. Now, this is where the first major change is. Adhesive. Now, the main difference here is that its DC is significantly lower. It's an 8. And that is... Now, it still has disadvantage on... Now, creatures that are grappled still have disadvantage. But, it's still a low DC. So, they're probably going to be able to break out. And my f thought process is... The Mimic is wounded, and it's, like, bleeding acid, because Mimics are, like, a set of creatures. And that it's like that's, like, kind of melting away at the adhesive goo that's on the uh, Mimic. So it's not as sticky as it would be, because it's just, it's solivizing? Solivizing? Solubilizing? Solivizing. It's basically, like, breaking down its own adhesive. So it's constantly trying to, like, re-up it, you know? It's, it's, it's not as sticky as it would be. And here's another big change, is false appearance. Normally... If a Mimic is in its object form, and it is not moving, nothing short of, like, detect life, or something like that, or, like, a, a spell that, like, detects living things, or, like, magic, can determine that it is a living thing. It's indistinguishable, as long as it remains motionless. Now, I changed it for here because it's injured. When it's in its object form, a creature can make a DC 10 perception check to hear its breathing. Like, I imagine, like, a really deep wheezing, like, it's very deep, like, almost like, uh, like, death rattles, kinda. If you ever hear that, that's terrifying. Uh, that sound coming from inside, like, this chest. And, you know, maybe the party puts together, it's not, it's like, inside the chest, it's the actual chest itself. The other thing is a investigation check. Ooh, let me fix it. That's a typo I have right there. I don't want to put the parentheses on the outside. That would have bugged me to death once I realized that. Anyway, so a DC 15 intelligence perception check. Not intelligence perception. DC 15 intelligence investigation check can be made to see the subtle movement of its breathing. It's trying to like stay still and be disguised, but it's it's really rough. So it's like you can see this like the little bit of boards kind of creak and move and shift. The little bits like, although it shouldn't really be metal because they can't really... Technically, they can't mimic metal, but that's besides the point. Like, like the bands on the outside that just slowly expanding and contracting when it shouldn't. You know, and then you realize, oh, this thing's breathing, it's alive, and that's how you know it's a mimic. Because, you know, it's injured, it's bleeding, it's sitting in a puddle of acid, probably. I don't know. Actions, it still has its damage. I did 
decrease it's to hit from five is normally I made it four because first of all I changed its strength to be lower so it's, it's gonna use a strength based attack so it's gonna be lower to hit so not that much of a difference just a minus one essentially but also I got rid of its modifier and I also made it so it's a d6 instead of a d8 so instead of an average damage of like of like seven it's only gonna have an average damage of like six for a pseudopod although it also does an extra d4 acid damage so that's gonna be closer to like oh sorry three so average of three plus an average of two five instead of seven so a little bit less damage the reason I give it acid damage on a pseudopod attack is because again I imagine it's a bleeding acid it's leaking acid it's you know not really control of that and also as per usual with mimics if you get struck by the pseudopod you get subject to the adhesive trait which means you get stuck to it it can be found uh, up here and bite similar to the first one where it's you know less to hit still only does a d6 piercing damage instead of a normal d8 plus three for the normal mimic and i also gave it instead of i think it's a d eight acid damage it's 2d4 acid damage so t statistically it's higher in damage its average is going to be like it's going to be on a scale from 2 to 8 as opposed to 1 to 8 so its average damage is going to be closer to like 5 than it is 4 and again that's just because normally mimics have acid damage on their bite but also it's again bleeding acid so it's a lot more acid in its bite now for loot, obviously it's going to be an easy kill for the most part, but still, you know, we want to have some loot because at one point this was a monster that contained loot. It has a bag of silver, which is a small leather pouch containing 3d4 plus 1d10 silver pieces. You know, pretty good chunk of change. And Mimic Adhesive, a viscous light purple substance that can form a strong adhesive bond between any two objects. The adhesive sets as soon as the creature comes into contact with it. Once it is done, so the bond it creates can be broken with a DC 13 strength save at the end of the creature's turn. Or just like a DC 13 strength or athletics check. Uh, as like either part of an item interaction or action. If it's like two objects stuck together. Like if you want to connect a chain to a wall, you know. But this could be used for like a trap. You could put glue on a door, the glue on a door handle. It's like trap a monster. You could use it to fix something, you know. A number of things. What's important is that you get some silver. It could also get some cool glue from this mimic. Now onto lore. I just use the term lore because it's basically like the backstory of the creature and like how to interact with it. I can't really think of a better term for it other than like interactions. Here's my like basic ideas. Now this isn't the only options players have. These are just the ones that I as a DM have thought of and have done the most prep for as you can see by this video. The first one is Wounded. It's very obviously, you know, the gimmick of the monster. Uh, this mimic has seen better days. It barely has any strength with the fight, and it produces a noticeable wheezing sound as it struggles to breathe. Because, like, you could hear it breathing. It's not a hard DC. In fact, most passive perceptions are going to pick up on it. Now, it's a DC 12 nature check to identify that the wounds were caused by the hook horror. So that's kind of more of the environment, the whole storytelling. Like, Oh, this hook horror is like, it's a big problem in this floor, on this floor. It's, it's causing a lot of damage. It's killed a guy, which you met, probably, the ghost. It caused the bush goblin to go into hiding. And now you find like a mimic, which are notorious for being like, pretty nasty ambush predators, just getting, just got its ass kicked by the hook horror. And uh, that, that just like, signifies, oh crap, this thing is uh, not to be trifled with. It's going to be a DC 13 medicine check to basically reveal that, yeah, this mimic is not going to survive unless you interfere. Like, it can't really hunt on its own at the time being. It's probably not going to recover. And if that hook horror comes back, it's basically screwed. Not to mention any other adventurers who might show up or any wandering monsters who might take advantage of it. And that's kind of like the beginning of our moral quandary here, our ethical dilemma. This thing will die unless you interfere. But also, it is not necessarily a thing that assisting it is going to benefit you, nor is it in any kind of like intellectual capacity to, you know, warrant it. 
it's a mimic. It is they're intelligent to a degree. They're, they're they have their own language. They're they're still like intelligent animals, but they're not. They don't possess that human-like intelligence that all the sentient races have. It's certainly nowhere as intelligent as like a goblin or an orc, let alone like a human or an elf or a dwarf or a gnome. But it also lends a credence to the idea of like, well, it's stupid, so isn't it innocent? Like, it is unaligned. It doesn't choose to be violent. It doesn't choose to be anything. It just is because it's it's an animal, essentially. Although it's a monstrosity and animals are beasts, it's functionally an animal. And it's going to be a DC-17, which is, you know, pretty difficult. Animal handling check to basically slowly approach it and basically calm it down to the point where you could use like cure wounds or lay on hands or any other like healing method like healer's kit or potion healing or anything like that which will basically bypass the uh, mimics adhesive trait now you could theoretically use that to like lure it into a false sense of security and then kill it and then take its loot but you know anyway so the second thing is grateful should the party assist the wounded mimic it'll be grateful for saving its life and that is the wrong it's and I feel ashamed of myself for not catching that earlier. Now, as I was saying, should the party assist the wounded mimic, it will be grateful. In the way that an animal is grateful. It will just cough up the uh, the pouch containing the silver. It will just give the party the silver pieces. And other mimics in the dungeon, like in different floors, they're maybe less likely to be hostile. You know, maybe there's like a door mimic that will just like say, hey, you helped out that mimic up there and you know i appreciate that so i'm just gonna let you through instead of having to go do a riddle or whatever or uh there's a mimic chest and it's just not gonna snap on you, you never find that's a mimic because it just lets you take its treasure you know or you open it and see there's nothing in it and then you're fine and you know or maybe it like opens one of its eyes and it kind of growls like kind of you know say hey listen I'm a mimic you may be not so dangerous or not so hostile but you know i'm i'm worried about you. i'm worried you know Stuff like that. And that's kind of like the idea of like a reputation system. And I don't want to make like a whole reputation chart for like, oh, there's a reputation for goblins and the skeletons and the mimics and all oh, the other things. And like that's a bit too excessive. But just as a DM, keep in mind the actions your party has done and the consequences or rewards of their actions and how that affects the NPCs as collectives. And yeah, that's our basic encounter you know it's not actually quite that basic but it's you know a very interesting moral dilemma you know yeah i mean it's a basically innocent animal and it's innocent in the case that it doesn't understand what's right or wrong you know if you have a druid in the party and it may say hey this is a monstrosity it shouldn't exist let's not let's let it die or let's kill it because it doesn't belong here or it could be like, well, this is the natural way. It's like, it was, it is a creature that was attacked by a predator, and now it's going to die, and that's the way it is. Or you could say, well, as a druid, you know, it may not be a natural creature, but it's still a creature. It's still an innocent animal, essentially, so you might as well try to heal it. Or maybe there's like a wizard or sorcerer who's like, well, let's, let's study it. Let's heal it so we can study it. Maybe it'll give us information, you know? And of course, there's going to be some members of the party who want to tame it and like keep it as a pet which maybe don't allow that because mimics are pretty deadly and having one that's allied to the party is pretty pretty overpowered at such a low level maybe maybe have it like where uh if they do like a really really good job like they put out all the stops for uh getting this mimic back and healthy if they do a whole uh a whole six million dollar man situation with this mimic then maybe like it'll follow them around and, like it'll just be like a mobile treasure chest for them they'll like carry their stuff for them nothing too crazy might help block doorways or something you know having it just be on the field and attack and defend them with their dying breath it's dying breath is a bit excessive so let's quickly hop back over to our uh our map and then we can give our closing thoughts all right here we are back on our map we have our wounded mimic in the corner here just using the regular treasure chest thing i do have a mimic token my usual stick guy style but it doesn't quite fit and it was also made not super hastily but i made it like an hour or so before a game that involved the mimic it was uh made by a wizard 
to uh, Garter Doorway. But that campaign's a bit weird because it's like a sci-fi space trucking game loosely based on Spelljammer. So that's besides the point. What's important is we have our Mimic here and we do have these two 10-foot doorways. So the Hook Horror can get through here. So, you know, if they're not careful, they could just come back later and find that the Hook Horror just wandered in this room because, you know, uh, I do want to have a system where every so often you roll randomly and then occasionally the hook horror will move closer or further away from a party. The party, rather. So we'll uh, we'll get around to that when we get to it. But maybe it wanders back in here and finishes off what it did if the party didn't get to it in time. That being said, so yeah, if you enjoyed this little ethical dilemma that's a million times cooler than the trolley problem because the trolley problem is stupid and this is actually cool because it involves a mimic then uh, like the video and comment how much you liked the video because it was a cool idea and subscribe to have this uh, channel in your subscription so you always know where to come back to find that video where a guy rambled about creature types and the ethics of saving wild animals in a video about mimics for some reason and uh, yeah I have no idea what else is going on so I apologize for the poor quality. It's not going to get any better.